Good morning and happy Father's Day to those who are able to be with us and to those who are not as well. Um, I, I told Lucinda, just as I got it for Kids on Fire, what I had planned to do is really not appropriate um, because not all of our children have their father physically present with us as we come around the table. I was listening this week, uh, actually preparing uh, for several days for some of these thoughts and remarks, and I was reading after Denzel Washington I was talking about how all of his running buddies when he was uh, growing up all ended up in jail except for him. And uh, the, the person said, well, well, what happened to you? And he said, well, my dad uh, told me to straighten up. They said, well, what about them? And he said, well, their dads were in jail. And he made the comment that, uh, you know, we can't really wait for society to solve this problem. And if we think that we're going to change society and we're going to solve this problem, we're starting too late. Because as he put it, they don't put seven-year-olds in jail. Now, all this is learned at home, and the solution is at home. And uh, other, other statistics like that have been quoted to say that when I was young, the, the mix of fathers in the home for the African-American culture was about 80-20, and now it's 20-80. That's a big change. That's a big turnaround. And, of course, some of the problems that we're reading about and hearing about right now have to do with incarceration and whether that problem of fathers being absent contributes to the realities that, that we see around us. And so when we say Happy Father's Day, and I noticed even this morning people were saying, well, it's going to be a different Father's Day. And I hear that every year as well. And so I thought about what, what could I say to, to be an encouragement and to highlight some of the needs that we have and there's a perfect place to begin, and I have already done so with the Kids on Fire group. But that message that I wanted us to have this morning is, you have a father. And, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to wonder about whether the things that you have experienced in your life leave you without any idea of what having a father would look like. You don't have to worry about whether you can physically be in the room with your earthly father, or whether your earthly father did or did not do things as you would wish they would be done. You have a father. And I believe this was a strong message in the ministry of Jesus. And I, I just want to show you two or three passages and talk for a moment about um, what Jesus came to communicate. And I'll begin in Luke chapter 2 at the end of the, of the chapter. Uh, Jesus had, shall we say, sneaked away, or he had found himself detained. He was in Jerusalem. The whole caravan had gone to Jerusalem for the, the feast, and at 12 years old, the caravan left, but he did not leave with them. And so, you know, his mother comes and says, Son, how could you do this to us? You know. And he said to them, Why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house or about my father's business, the King James said as I grew up? My father. Now you probably don't have, as I don't have, the, the memory of what was being taught to, to Jewish boys for hundreds and thousands of years before this time. But let me just say, this phrase is not one that's used very often. I'll show you a few of the times that it was used. But here at age 12, you have Jesus suggesting there's another dimension to this idea that I have a father. And though he very likely was standing there, he's talking about something else. Now in John chapter 2, we're at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, and very early in Jesus' ministry, the, the first of his public signs done at Cana of Galilee is at the beginning of the chapter. But Jesus goes into to the temple and he turns the tables over of those who are selling merchandise and, and, and he says, take these away, stop making my father's house 
a place of business. Now, there was a kickback at that point. They, that was not appreciated. That kind of talk was not appreciated. They asked him to prove that he had the right to use words like that. And he said, destroy this temple, in three days I'll rebuild it. And that came back to his trial three years later. This was a very controversial idea. This was something that, that Jewish uh, boys really didn't say that often. And certainly not about God. And so in John chapter 5, uh, John, by the way, using the word Father over a hundred times in his gospel, we report this day where Jesus has healed someone on the Sabbath. Actually, it was the man at the pool. The beginning of chapter 5. And his answer back to why did you do this and what gave you the right is, well, my father is working until now. Or shall we say, as we speak. And I myself am working and, and if you, at that point, are kind of getting the message, let me be clear, they definitely got the message. It says, for this reason, in verse 18, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, not because he was, only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So they got it. They said, uh, you can't talk like that. Because God is not your father. Now think about those words. We have entered the room today. We have come to worship. I've, I've had a very calm conversation with our children about how God is their father. We have sung about it. We've thanked God for it. We've praised God for it. It's, it's part of our everyday language. Um, there's a reason for that. But that wasn't so when Jesus came. And he was argued with when he started referring to God as his Father. And he used the word, my Father, over and over as he spoke to the people. Uh, I think even in our prayer this morning, this, this phrase eked out. This is actually the title of uh, one of the top 50 songs that's being sung in worship today. We have a good, good Father. It's who you are. And, uh, and, and that, that idea, as I said, has, has really permeated our lives as Christians. And, and I, I think it's time for us to accept the intention of Jesus in giving us the gift of knowing what, as a human being, it feels like to look at your heavenly Father as a Father. Notice how how incredibly easy that was for him. We know the story in, in Matthew 2 uh, about uh, Joseph being told what's happening. We know that, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 1, this is the Savior, as we re uh, read in class this morning. He will save his people from their sins. It will be God with us. You're going to have this child. But everything that Joseph and Mary are both told is very clear the father to this child is actually God. It's not Joseph. And so this one Jesus is born and he comes into the earth and, and he goes to the temple because he's about his father's work at 12. And he, and he reads it in the synagogue and listens to the word being read and that's really his father. And as a human being, this is, this is an experience that's really not been had on this level. And yeah, he emptied himself of, of being God, but now he is experiencing what it's like to, to relate to God as if God were his actual father. And what a gift that is. Now, I want to I look at a couple of passages. I'll just, I'll just look at one in the Old Testament. And, and I, this actual phrase, my father, is used in Genesis 22. And we're on the mountain which Jerusalem was actually built on. And Abraham has taken his son up this mountain, and it says that Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So we see a child old enough to know 
shall we say, old enough to suspect. And clearly in a moment, old enough to experience what it might feel like to have your father tie you up and put you on an altar and raise a knife. This, this incredible experience is the first time I find in Scripture where a, a child looked up at his father and said, My father. And there's, there's something more urgent, more personal, as you can see from the context of the whole experience. There, there's something going on here, and even, and even Abraham refers to him as my son. There, that, that personal dimension is really being communicated. There's a, there's a great deal of angst going on on the top of that mountain. And God is about to remedy all of it by presenting a different offering. And so that is not what occurs. But here's that phrase kind of planted in the person of Abraham thousands of years before Jesus. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. This is really where I want us to, to kind of focus this message this morning. I'll start actually in 14. All who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So here, you know, Jesus evidently started something that is being continued. And Paul begins writing about us. Now, how do we look at God? Well, if, if God's Spirit is in us, then, then we can call ourselves sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, leave that on the screen. Abba is actually an Aramaic word. We know that Jesus spoke some Aramaic. And we know that it's likely that Jesus used this term. But in my reading, this is not a common Jewish word that a child would call his father. At the time of Jesus, it may have become that. The Hebrew word, however, for father is the, the syllable av, A-V, av. Well, like what we do when we say papa or dada, there's a doubling often of a syllable. Or in this case, a transposing, ava. The adding of the A on the end of the sound. And there's a little controversy about Ava and whether that's really something that was as endearing as it has been said. I can remember this uh, controversy going back into my teenage years um, because apparently someone in, in my young life stood up at a pulpit somewhere and over the airwaves prayed that morning and said, Hi, Dad. And the audience basically erupted. And everyone said, you can't do that. You can't call God Dad. That's just wrong. And that went on for a long time. And it's very formative for me because I remember thinking, well, it's kind of personal, but fits, you know. Not something I've ever heard before, but I don't, can you really call it wrong? Maybe you've heard someone do that, and maybe it affected you that way. Well, now think of how the Jews may have felt when Jesus is walking around the temple saying, My Father. They're oh, 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 wait a minute. Almighty God, God of the hosts, Lord of the armies. Uh, we can think of a lot of words we use for God. My Father's not one of them. Well, he kind of rocked the boat, didn't he? And as we've taught for three weeks, we also do not have a spirit of timidity. Cowardice is not something that comes from God. Slavery is not something that comes from God. But sonship, and, and for our gender-sensitive folks, there's a reason it needs to be son to the Roman people. Because we all know, as a daughter... You were not an heir. Culturally that, culturally, that just didn't exist. 
And so in order to gain the concept that's really being said here, you're fully brought into the family. It may be adoption. There is the one and only begotten Son of God. We, however, are adopted. We are brought in and given the standing, loved, wanted, chosen, desired. And so... When we look up at God, we, we give him that beloved Ava, Father. Ava, my Father. There is a personal dimension to the, to the concept that God is our Father. Now, all of the things that we hold dear about fatherhood have all of the things we know about God contained in them. The idea of begetting. <laughs> that, that God is our creator. In Adam's case, he took dust and he formed it and then he breathed into it and, and there was a human being. And even for Eve, he took some of his creation, the rib, and made it into a woman and fashioned something that, that would cause Adam to say, wow, when he saw her. And this creative aspect is something, you know, that's beloved about fatherhood. The whole idea of caring for, the whole idea of caring on your shoulders, the whole idea of, of loving and being tender and teaching and nurturing, all of these ideas fit very cleanly with the concept of a God who loves us. And all of those phrases are used in Scripture to describe how he treats us, though the term father is kind of light coming on. Once again, Jesus enters humanity, comes to the earth, and he gives us language for something that we really hadn't seen before. It was there all the time, we just really didn't see it, as Lyndall shared with us on Wednesday night. He never contradicted his father. He never tried to say, you know, God didn't really get it right, so let me, let me explain. <laughs> it was like, more like, you didn't get it right. You weren't really hearing all that God was saying, so here's the rest of what's really in some of these laws. And I want to I close this morning putting something on the screen. And maybe at this point, it's kind of an aha for you. It is the phrase, Our Father. I've talked this morning as if this is somewhat of a foreign idea, a concept that we really don't spend a lot of time with. And yet, surely, as you see these words in print, you cannot help but realize, oh yes, this was quite intentional, was it not, on Jesus' part. Jesus, we notice, we notice you have this very special relationship with God. We notice that you sneak off in the morning while it's still dark, and what are you doing? But you're talking to your Father. Teach us how to talk like that. We even created a word that could describe that kind of unique and special conversation. We call it prayer. And I was taught, and many of you were taught, that if we're going to pray, we're going to stop everything. There should be no rustling in the room. There should be no movement. Eyes should be closed. Heads should be bowed. And all of this reverence goes into this phrase. But look at these words. Our Father. Jesus did not just come to say, My Father, oh, I'm God's Son, look at me. Jesus came to share His Father with you and I. That's the whole point. Early in His ministry, they said, Teach us to talk to God like that. And so He says, All right. Here are your first words. Our Father, who art in heaven. What are the next words? Hallowed be thy name. See, we could, we could sit here and recite the whole prayer, could we not? This is second nature to us. But as I told the kids this morning, it's time for the idea that God is our Father to become so every day that we literally look around to see which side of us he might be standing on at this moment. 
because we, we sense the very presence of God. And yes, He's up there, and yes, He's everywhere. But if we cannot see He is with us, then we're missing what Jesus tried to share with us. And so I beg us this morning, let us take what Jesus wanted us to have as a gift and appreciate it and understand it. And I'm going to go one more step. When Jesus said that, he did not continue with the words, accept. Christianity is being maligned today. It's being lied about. And we're allowing it to happen because of our own insistence on being silent when we should speak. The world is being told that there are many religions and that these religions all have their little following and their little, I'm mad at you and I'll kill you and we're the only ones and all of that. This is not the message of Jesus. God the Creator, the Creator of all, promised to Abraham he would bring blessing to the entire earth through all the families of the earth and through David continued that that rain would bless and go to the ends of the earth as we studied in class this morning. And Jesus prayed that day, Our Father... Because there was no one who could hear it or who would ever hear. This is how you pray that it would not apply to. The Creator wants to have a single family called the human race. And it's His children who keep getting it wrong. Well, we're the chosen people. Well, we're the special people. Well, we're the... Who died and left you in charge? Jesus died and cleaned all that away. And he used his blood to do it. And so as Paul preached, he made from one blood every on earth. Everyone on earth. It is time that this message resonate from God's people, from the Lord's church. The truth is... He is our Father. And that should dictate how I speak to, how I listen to, how I treat, and how I champion for anyone that this is true of. Folks, it's time to get right. It's time our world heard it from us. Because of all people, we should know it best. This morning, if it's your desire to be an heir, a son, a child of your father, to receive the blessings of the household, as in the, the closest of the family relationships, so that you could take your place among those who call out and say, Our Father, this is for all of us. It's our desire that you'll come to him. And we pledge not to stand in the way and not to make barriers he didn't make and not make exceptions that he never stated. The invitation is open to you and we invite you come while we stand and sing.